Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of the Global Animal, um, Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Our next session is uh, Emergency Livestock Programs um, in Alberta, Canada, with Dr. Melissa Moggy. And this session is proudly sponsored by the C4 Group. It's a privilege to have Melissa here with us today. And uh, if you're interested in reading her bio and abstract, they're available on the, our website under the Speakers tab. Before we start, just some basic housekeeping. The Zoom um, chat function has been disabled um, for the webinar. So if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A section and we'll try to get to those questions at the end of the session. We'd also encourage you to use the hashtag GADMConf um, for Twitter and for social media. And a short evaluation of the session will be available at the end of this, um, this presentation. Um, just as a reminder, the videos are being recorded and they'll be made available after they've been edited and they'll be released as part of our GADMAC um, award ceremony in July. So without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Melissa Moggy and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Mel. <clears throat> um, I am very excited to be able to talk to you today about Alberta's Livestock Emergency Resources. Um, I am a veterinarian and I am an extension coordinator for Alberta Farm Animal Care who hosts and contributes to two of the resources that I'm going to discuss today. And because of that, of course, I have to have the mandatory, mandatory slide that is who is Alberta Farm Animal Care. And we're just gonna go over this quickly because it's the boring stuff. Um, Alberta Farm Animal Care was formed in 1993. I apologize if you can hear my dog in the background. Um, and we were created by the livestock industry to be an organization that was just for animal care and welfare. And we have grown since then to be a trusted source of information for um, the industry, but also for the public. And we believe that we work better collaboratively than as a single organization. All right, now on to the fun stuff. Um, we are located in Alberta, Canada. And I just wanted to give you an idea of what Alberta is like and why we actually need these resources. So Alberta produces about 40% of Canada's beef animals. Um, we raise about 30% of Canada's horses, 11% of the pigs, and almost 17% of Canada's sheep are raised here. And we have a very large equestrian um, industry in Alberta. So we know that we have animals transporting throughout the province for slaughter, sale, show, training, you name it. So we have thousands of animals being transported across Canada every week, many of which go through Alberta. And so this is just a map that I stole from Stats Canada. And for every red dot on the map, it represents 2,500 beef cows, not beef cattle in general, just beef cows. And so we can see here that this is Alberta. And we can see that the majority of those animals are kept in central and southern Alberta. And honestly, up here, there's a whole lot of nothing mostly, but we do have animals that get transported back and forth through there. And so because we have all of these animals in our province and because we have so much animals moving around in our province, we know that there's a higher risk of an, emer an emergency situation. And so Alberta does have a number of emergency resources available. We have the, the usual, um, like Alberta SPCA, um, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is the equivalent to the FBI in Canada. It's our national police force. Um, of course, we have local uh, police and fire departments. Alberta is special in a few other things and where we have agricultural fieldmen that work with the Agricultural Service Board to develop and implement control programs. And they may be there as a regulatory officer, but not for the same capacity that the police or the SPCA or the RCMP are. They're the individuals there that are going to help you with your understanding the Weed Control Act in Alberta. We also have Fish and Wildlife. Um, not always, but sometimes emergency situations happen that cross over with fish and wildlife, so we work with them. Um, we have an organization called Farmers Advocate, which is solely there to help farmers understand their rights. And so the last two, which are going to be the focus of this presentation, is the Livestock Emergency 
uh, equipment handling trailers and the alert line. So starting off with the emergency hand livestock equipment handling trailers, which I'm just going to refer to as the trailers from now on because it is quite a mouthful. Um, what exactly are they? They are trailers equipped with pretty much everything you would need in the event of a livestock emergency. And they are often housed at fire stations or county offices. And that's because livestock emergencies don't happen between nine, and nine to five on a Tuesday. Um, they usually happen between uh, 8 p.m. and 3 a.m. on a new moon when, on a new moon in a cloudy sky when you can't see anything. Um, and so we deci they decided that it would be best to house them in the fire stations because the fire department are the ones that respond usually to these instances and they need to be able to access them. So a little bit of history on the trailers. Um, they weren't actually created by Alberta Farm Animal Care. Um, they were created by first the Red Deer County office and then the Pinoca County office. They recognized that they had a gap in resources for livestock emergencies that were happening and they thought this would be a good solution. In walks Alberta Farm Animal Care a little while later and we acknowledge that this is a fantastic idea and we get a grant to help build more trailers. And so because of that grant, we were able to produce five more. And unfortunately, we don't have funding anymore to help create trailers. So we function um, administratively for the trailers. We communicate between them. We do their annual reporting. Um, and the alert line also is used to dispatch the trailers. And we, of course, help them with training as well. Since that that time, 11 more have come along. And so we have a total of 18 trailers in the province. Now, this is a map of our trailers. And if you're a keener, you might notice like, hey, Melissa, there's 17 on here, not 18. Um, and that's because one of the trailers is for the Alberta SPCA. Um, and they use it primarily for um, seizures but it can be used in an emergency situation to evacuate animals. For instance, we had um, really bad fires um, a few years back um, where an entire city had to be evacuated. And we, that was an area that was very heavy in livestock, especially horses. And so the trailer was used, it, it was even used um, to evacuate cats and dogs. And so we dispatch these trailers one of three ways. You can call 911 and the 911 dispatcher will most likely dispatch the trailer for you. Unfortunately, one of the challenges we have is that there is a really high turnover rate in 911 operators. And because of that high turnover rate, they don't always know that a trailer exists. And that's why we offer the alternative for people to be able to call the alert line to dispatch the trailers. Another resource that we created was um, actually what's on the screen right now is a trailer card. And it looks something like this. Um, and we have instructions on there on how to access a trailer. And so the one on the screen is actually a public facing uh, trailer card. And so that they can know which counties have a trailer for them to access. But these trailer cards, this one I have right here, is actually special in that it is for stakeholders in the livestock industry. And on the back is the same map, but I have phone numbers for each county. And that might be that they don't want to give you a number and they just want you to call 911. It might be that it's the county fire department line or sometimes it is the fire chief's cell phone number, which is why I'm not turning it around, just in case someone screen grabs it. Now, unfortunately, I don't have 2020 stats for you at this point for the trailer usage. Um, I'm in the process of getting that information from the, from the fire chiefs, um, but unfortunately I don't have all that right now. For 2019, we had seven cattle liner rollovers and six incidences where a vehicle collided with a cattle liner. There is no pattern in 
how the trailers are used. I have no way of estimating how much the trailers are going to be used in one year because there are so many different circumstances under which a trailer is called that, to, that have so many factors involved. So we might be looking at, these were all roadside incidences, but we might have barn collapses or barn fires. We have animals that get stuck in weird locations in the mud and the ice and the trailers are utilized during those scenarios as well. And so we, we know that if we're going to have a hard winter, we might have more calls. If we have a, a lot of fires in one year, we might have a lot of barn fires as well. It varies from year to year. One of the major things that goes along with these trailers is the training so that the individuals using the equipment know what they're doing and that they stay safe because a large animal emergency is a high risk emergency for the personnel involved. And so we know that we have two options for training for our first responders. One is a local college in Alberta called Lakeland College. They offer agricultural and first responder training. So it was just a, a good fit that they would be able to offer the livestock emergency training. The other training that we offer is the technical large animal emergency response training, which I won't go into a great detail because Dr. Rebecca Husted is going to be discussing that later on today. But it is an excellent course that we offer for our first responders it's an opportunity for them to see these animals, their mannequins, in real world situations and learn how is the best and safest way to go about helping these animals. And of course, they learn about handling animals, normal animal behavior, because a lot of times our first responders don't have any livestock experience and we want them to be safe. So one of the the ways I mentioned that you can dispatch the, the trailers is through the alert line. And the alert line is a resource that Alberta Farm Animal Care offers for, we say for Alberta, but really if you call from anywhere else in Canada, we will connect you with resources if we know what they are. Um, the alert line was created in 95 because the livestock industry actually demanded that we have a producer driven animal care helpline. This is a, a, a line that you can call if you need help or advice in caring for your animals. And even that we encourage the public to call if they have questions or concerns about how livestock are cared for. We work within the industry, so we often have volunteers that work in the industry already that help with our line and we collaborate with the Alberta SPCA and the RCMP when needed. The alert line does not have any regulatory capacity so we can't press charges. We're there proactively to help people when they need help taking care of their animals and if needed we will forward on to the appropriate uh, organizations if we need to. We have access to a team of veterinarians when we need for counseling and we also have a staff of three that alternate answering the alert line every two weeks just to avoid burnout. We would love to have a larger staff but unfortunately um, you know we have a budget and we have to stick to it. So exactly how does the alert line work? Every call is unique and different. It's, there is no set steps that we always follow, but we have designed a series of events that can occur depending on the situation to ensure that livestock are being cared for. Again, this is completely volunteer based, but we ensure that our volunteers have the appropriate skills, training or expertise we want them to be able to assess an animal and its environment and tell us, hey, there's a situation here or actually there's no situation, we're good. And so we have, like I mentioned, we don't have any legal status, we can't press charges, um, but we work with those that can. When we have a call that comes in, the caller remains anonymous. We want to make that perfectly clear that you can call on on your neighbor if you want to, and we're not gonna be able to say who called. But 
we often do ask for a lot of information from these people and we often encourage them to share their details for follow-up. And that's because we try to gather as much as information as possible from them on the, when they initially call, but sometimes we get a call from someone and it's because they've seen an issue a week ago and it's at a on a rural road somewhere in Red Deer County, but that doesn't help me. I need more information. And so lately we've been encouraging people to please take pictures and pin their locations when they call so that we can find the location and we can work with the farmer. So essentially calls fall into one of three categories, cases, information calls, and trailer calls. A trailer call is essentially just they need a trailer and we contact the trailer and dispatch it. And I'm going to go over the difference between a case and an information call. So this looks like a lot of information and cases are very complex usually because they're, like I said, very unique. A resource team member may conduct a drive-by, a farm visit, or just contact the farmer by phone after we receive a call to determine if there's actually an issue. Um, we will get the volunteer in the area to drive by and often a, ca a call that we'll get is um, that people are concerned that the animals don't have feed or water. And so we drive by and the volunteer will either tell us, yes, there is no feed and water, this is an issue, or actually um, over the hill from the road they took, there's access to feed and water. It just wasn't visible from where they were driving. And that, that happens a lot. So our essential thing that we do first off is determine if there's actually a concern. If there is a circumstance in where we can't see anything from the road and we're denied access and we can't see the animal, then we call the Alberta SPCA because there's always the chance that there is a, a serious situation going on that we can't see. So we'd rather have um, the Alberta SPCA in this case than not. Our volunteers will assess, like I said, assess the animal's condition and the environment when they do their initial assessment. And if it is a serious case, if we see dead animals on the property or we see animals that are emaciated, if we see evidence of neglect or abuse, then we forward this case on to the Alberta SPCA because it's too far gone for us. We're happy to work with the uh, SPCA, but this is something where we need the big guns, not just the alert line. If we determine that this is a management issue, um, the alert line coordinator and the volunteer and the owner, whether or not it's a farmer or not, will discuss the issue, will come up with a solution, and will determine a agreed upon time frame for which that solution will be, will be done. And this situation will be monitored by the volunteer. And the, usually the monitoring is just driving by the farm to see if they are starting to make the changes we, we talked about. If we talked about, you know, you need more feed in winter because of our cold temperatures, then do we see that additional feed be get, being given? Um, if it's a situation where the animals are not given enough space, then we might look at um, have they been spread out more or sometimes we have to make that hard discussion with the farmer and say you have to decrease the size of your herd you're having issues managing such a large herd and so we'll monitor and see if the herd size does decrease all of this information is um, reported to the alert line coordinator that keeps track of everything between um, um, different team members because often cases will, will keep going after one alert line um, person goes off. And so we want to keep track and make sure that nothing's getting missed. If, I would also like to point out that if there's ever a situation where um, the owner or the farmer becomes aggressive in any manner, then we, we forward it to the RCMP. Um, we'd rather have the police involved than not. And that, that very rarely happens. Now, if there's actually no concern, um, we've done a drive-by, we've talked with the farmer, 
there's actually no concern, then we take this as an educating opportunity. We want, we talk with the person that called and educate them about appropriate practices. And so he, these are some pictures actually that I have to give you an example of what our information calls usually are. Um, we often get calls in the winter time because the cows are outside and they must be cold. So why can't we put them inside? And then we explain they're beef cows, they acclimate to the winter and given the appropriate support from farmers, they do just fine. Um, my favorite information call that we, we get about once every other year is um, that some of the elk at an elk farm are really, really skinny. The farmer must not be taking care of them. And this always happens during the rut. And during the rut, the males have only one thing on their mind and it's not food. So I get to have that, we get to have that um, discussion where the males aren't eating because they're mating. It's normal for them to lose a lot of body, a lot of weight during this time and everything's fine. Um, usually the caller's a little embarrassed, but we don't expect everyone to know the intricacies of every single industry. And finally, one other thing that we often get called at is the lack of shelter. And people often don't realize that a tree line, like in the picture here, is an acceptable source of shelter um, for many livestock species. And just because we don't have a building doesn't mean that the animals aren't protected. And so I think that I am, I am on time and I wanna thank you for listening to all of this information. I know it's a lot, but these two resources that we have implemented in Alberta have been very helpful and they are very, maybe not easily, but they are integratable into other communities and we've had interest from other provinces and states. So I thought this was a great opportunity for people to be aware of these resources. Um, for more information, you can visit our website or you can email me. I have my email here up on the screen and I welcome any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Melissa, for a really interesting um, presentation and uh, the beautiful photographs. It's really interesting to be somewhere like Australia and see your wildlife and the environmental conditions you have to deal with and feel almost envious um, in, in our summers anyway, that, um, that we've got uh, cool weather. Um, so I'd like to encourage our, uh, our attendees to, to put something in the q and I noticed um, as you were talking, we did have one question. We've got a couple more since. So Erica's asked, um, can you say a little bit more about the maintenance of the trailers and their contents and how that that's funded? Absolutely. Um, those, of course, the funding for the trailers varies um, depending on the county because each county has determined how that funding for that trailer is going to do going to be. Um, but we I can say that the initial cost for doing for setting up the minimum equipment you need for a trailer and in, this includes the trailer cost of course is about $40,000 Canadian. So that's how much they have to raise. Um, I haven't seen a single trailer that doesn't have stickers on it from sponsors. So a lot of sponsoring goes on for these trailers to be created. I can't comment on the amount of money it takes for the maintenance because each trailer is a little different. Um, but essentially we're looking at most of the equipment in there is for the long term, but there are some short term things that you're going to have to replenish. That being, you know, things like shavings, um, feed. We always recommend that people have feed in the trailers. Um, we've had a few instances where we will have <clears throat> police um, chasing an animal and for a very long time trying to catch them and then a trailer will come shake a, a bucket of feed and the animals come running to them and they and they catch them in no time. <laughs> Fantastic. We have another one here from Deborah, just um, because it relates to the same um, issue. Is who pays for the insurance on the trailers? Ah, that's a very good question. So the insurance on the trailers is um, is 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 gotten by the uh, the county itself, and every trailer has their own individual insurance. Um, 
we do have issues with insurance. I like this question because some trailers can leave their province and help, or not their province, their county, and help another county. But other ones, because of their insurance, they aren't allowed to leave their county. And so if anyone was ever considering getting a trailer, that is something that you should look into for your insurance because it's, it's often very frustrating when we have an emergency situation in a county without a trailer and the neighboring county has one, but they can't leave. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure a lot of people listening in have, have encountered similar things, you know, both getting um, financial support to buy something like this that has a, a maintenance cost to it, as well as that initial sort of startup and, um, and then dealing with the day-to-day -day things like the insurance. Um, we've got another question here, and I, I, it's, I think it's really interesting because I assume you rely a lot on, on trust um, because you know, you're dealing a lot with, um, with, with people in difficult situations sometimes. And uh, one of the uh, attendees here, Deborah, has asked about, would it be fair to say that your volunteers get a lot of pushback um, upon sort of reproach um, from these sorts of things? And, and how, what do you do to sort of manage um, that relationship? Absolutely. Um, it's, I think it's very normal for people to be defensive when you approach them about how they care for their animals. It's very similar to how you would, if you went up to a parent and, and told them that they weren't raising their child right. Um, they're, they're, they're very um, emotional, I guess, for lack of a better word. And so we offer our volunteers communications training <clears throat> so that they know what to expect and that they know how to respond and how not to respond. We would love to be able to offer more training to our volunteers, but because of our limited funding, it usually only comes in the form of um, a video and a handbook. Um, but if we ever have communications training, we encourage them that they should take it. Um, we also acknowledge, we tell them, you know, this is perfectly normal for them to be um, to be emotional and we tell them like just tell them that it's it's okay we're not here to press any charges and often when we tell them that we don't have any regulatory capacity we're not the police we're not the SPCA we can't take your animals away they usually calm down quite a bit because initially I think they think that we're just going to come onto their property and take their animals away and we make it very clear no we're here to work with you um, yes, there's always the possibility that we might have to alert the authorities, but we're here to work with you so that doesn't happen. And I would say that even the people that we meet that have a very angry initial response, I would say about 80% of them cool down, we give them some time, and then we talk with them later and, and things usually work out just fine. because. Sometimes we do have to threaten that we, we might have to call the police, but very rarely does that happen. Yeah, and obviously, you know, I think we, a lot of us appreciate the, uh, the emotional sort of management of people as being a, you know, a, a quite a challenging thing, let alone the, the animals and taking care of them. Um, a, a couple of uh, attendees have asked about the contents of the trailers. I, I've already mentioned that a little bit, so I'll just bring it up again. Um, and the question is, did, does the website include any information about what's in those trailers? Is it possible to find out what you have in them? That's an excellent question. Um, I am actually, <clears throat> as part of my annual reporting for the trailers, I've requested that they all give me a list of what they now have, because depending on their situations, they've grown and they've added things. Um, we do have the basic list and that's not, I don't believe that's on the website, but if you email me, I will gladly share that with you. Um, and once we actually have that list, I'd be happy to share that with you. We, we know that there's some trailers that have a lot of equipment. For instance, the Red Deer County, the very first trailer has been around the longest and they've really invested in their trailer. And it's always the one that I, if I can get a hold of, um, I use to, for demonstrations. Fantastic. Yeah, that, I think that sort of adaptation and sort of um, is, is really great to capture when you can. It gives us sort of the outside ideas as well. Um, uh, Lana here has asked whether the trailers have been used in any large scale disasters, um, such as the Southern Alberta floods or Fort Mac fires. So the fire that I referred to earlier that the um, SPCA trailer was used in to evacuate animals was the Fort Mac fire um, where 
the entire town of Fort Mac had to be evacuated because of this large fire. And unfortunately, we are, people are beginning to think that we actually have a fire season, which I, I, I'm sure you can relate to. And, and we, we have instances where we need to evacuate animals quickly because of fires. Unfortunately, we do have a lot of grassland and grass fires happen so quickly that we often can't get trailers there in time, but when we can, they are utilized for natural disasters. Fantastic. Um, we've got an, a really interesting question here, I think, from, um, from Antonio, who asked about how, how does the SP, SP, sorry, SPCA respond to your role in the animal welfare process? Um, clearly, there's some messiness here. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we do step on each other's toes sometimes. I'm not going to say that we always work together fantastically. Um, but we have been working with the SPCA for so long and we've determined when a case needs to be forwarded to the SPCA that we've developed a really good working relationship. We both know that we're there for the betterment of the animals at the end of the day. And there are circumstances where the SPCA isn't able to do anything because there's n nothing they can do regulatory wise. Um, but we can, we can try to be there and help with the education piece. And so, yes, we do have times where we butt heads, but we, we are starting to work together now after 15 years of working together, we're finally starting to work together better. Fantastic. Um, so Deborah asks here, if the trailers are used for equines, um, in addition to the cattle and livestock, um, suggesting that perhaps there are tougher insurance rules around horses and whether that's mm. problematic. The trailers are not usually used to actually transport animals because they're so full with equipment. Um, but they are, they're not, they're not usually horse trailers. They're, they're square trailers. Um, I have been asked before, you know, can we put animals in the trailer? And I mean, you, you could a very small amount of small animals. Like if we had an incident with a few pigs maybe, but the animals are, are, they're not designed for that. Essentially what the trailers are designed for is for containment. We want in situations where we have large animals in an emergency situation, like let's say it's a trailer rollover. We use the equipment in the trailer to confine the animals because we have a lot of fencing in there. And so we'll confine them to an area. We'll offer them feed and water if we can, and then we'll coordinate for an actual livestock trailer or a horse trailer to come and load them onto that. And of course, depending on the situation, we might need to, to have a few trailers if we need to have some animals go to a veterinarian or depending on the situation. And, and do you have your own, your own haulers for the trailers? So the, the haulers for the trailers is the fire department that for that county. And so they do have um, those, those big um, F-250 trucks for um, pulling the trailers. We're getting some great questions here. I hope you're okay to continue. Absolutely. Um, so how do you raise awareness and promote the services to the public? It's a really good question. Um, so we, we depend a lot on social media to share that message. And we, have, we do have a video um, on our YouTube channel about the trailers. It actually needs to be updated because we have a new one since then. Um, we also, of course, share the trailer cards as much as possible with people. Um, I have one in my car at all times. If someone's like, oh, I've never heard of that, like one second, here you go. Um, so it's a lot of word of mouth because with our agricultural industry, those are the people we really want them to know that, that the alert line and the trailers are here for them. And of course, we do communicate it with the public at public events as well. So we attend um, a lot of agricultural events. Uh, we have the Calgary Stampede here every year. And so we have opportunities to talk with the public and say like, hey, these resources exist. If you see any livestock um, in an emergency situation, they're there for you. And of course, a lot of our members with Alberta Farm Animal Care 
are the livestock commodity groups. So even if we can't get to their producers, they can share the information down the line with their producers that those resources are there for them. So we try to reach out as far as we can, but um, I will say that it's never enough. People, people forget, new people come into the industry. It's, it's always a, a work in progress. Sure. I think this might be our last question. So um, just to put this to you, um, this is more about operational sort of prioritization. So um, if you have a, a large scale event or a number of different um, uh, uh, requests coming at the same time, do you have a way to prioritize or triage those? That's an excellent question. Um, I can't think of a situation where that's actually happened. Um, if that were to happen, we would depend on people on the ground to tell us where they need to go. Um, the, the fire departments will, are the ones that often operate these trailers. And so they will communicate with each other if a trailer is more useful at one location than another. And we have to remember that in these emergency situations, humans are invo involved too. And the fire departments will always prioritize human safety. So if, they're, if we need to, well, we're going to let the, the ambulances in first before the trailers. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Melissa. I think we're going to draw this to a close now. Um, so thank you attendees for coming along to the session and for those great questions. Uh, it was a really good session. Um, our next um, GADMAC uh, presentation is going to be in about one and a half hours time and we'll look forward to seeing you then. And th this is about the, um, yeah, the, uh, the approach to disposal or to carcass management. So that's going to be another interesting angle to bring into this uh, whole discussion. So thanks very much and we'll see you again later.